This is Keys to the Shop, episode 215, a masterclass in marketing and communication with Spencer M. Ross, PhD. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DiFerio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're doing fantastic, uh, staying healthy and well. Now, I would really appreciate if you would uh, subscribe to the show. If you haven't done so already, just hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, I'm pretty partial to Overcast myself, but uh, whatever yours happens to be, uh, hit subscribe and you'll always be updated with fresh content. And we're producing a lot of it these days. We've got a whole COVID-19 focus series happening amidst the um, regular broadcasts from Keys to the Shop, and hopefully that's a helpful resource for you all. Now, I want to make you aware that Keys to the Shop has started a private community for uh, coffee shop owners and professionals in retail specialty coffee, Uh, Keys to the Shop listeners like yourselves, joining together to talk about their shops, their ideas, Um, help solve each other's problems, really just cross-pollination of techniques and tools and um, good conversations between peers. That's what it's all about. It's the Mighty Network for Keys to the Shop. Uh, It's on the Mighty Network platform, and there is a link in the show notes for you to click on if you want to join. And uh, you could also just email me, chris at keystotheshop.com, and request to be added to that group. Uh, It is growing uh, really well, and I'm, I'm so excited to see the conversations uh, growing on that network. And I hope to see you in the network. So uh, hit me up on that link in the show notes, or you can just reach out directly to chris at keys to the shop.com. Now today's masterclass on marketing and communication is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers. And if you're in the market for commercial equipment, then partnering with Prima Coffee is one of the best decisions that you can make uh, because they curate the best equipment from all over the world and they work tirelessly to match it with your needs to make sure that whatever your situation is, you're going to get the right gear for your context. Now, if you go to prima-coffee.com, you'll see what I mean, a fantastic selection but also an incredible resource because they have videos and blogs, tutorials that will help you use this equipment and teach you how to make things like latte art and brew coffee. Uh, They just do this for free because they're all about facilitating your success in specialty coffee, equipping you with what it takes. So I would encourage you to go to prima-coffee.com, reach out to them and see how they can help you get the right gear for your situation. Again, that's prima-coffee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series. The Barista Series is an amazing line of plant-based performance beverages that truly perform on the bar because not only have they been designed for the professional barista, but with a lot of feedback from some of the world's best professional baristas. So you know that no matter what you choose, the almond, soy, coconut, rice, oat, hemp, Uh, you'll know that that product will uh, be able to take the heat from steaming, produce latte art-ready textured milk, and it will keep the flavor balance focused on the coffee. It just does an amazing job on the bar, and that's what you want from a plant-based beverage, something you can count on, and that is the Barista Series. So I would encourage you to get this in your shop and try it out for yourselves. So to find out more information, go to pacificfoods.com, follow the link in the show notes here, and yeah, if you want to offer the best plant-based beverages to your customers, then you absolutely need to be carrying the Barista Series from Pacific Foods. All right, everybody. So today we get to do a deep dive into the world of marketing and communications, uh, something that is always relevant in our industry because it's a cornerstone of what our brick and mortar retail stores are all about. And uh, as we are in the middle of this crisis, um, we are finding that communication and marketing is more important than ever as we all try to adjust and be and become agile as companies and take on different means of communication. Uh, we're looking at also amplifying and uh, improving our current and existing forms of communication and marketing. Um, the question is really, you know, where do we start? How do we go forward? What 
what does it take to create a great program uh, if, for marketing and communication in the world of specialty coffee retail? And I think today's episode is going to answer those questions for you. Today, we're talking with Spencer M. Ross, PhD. Spencer is the assistant professor of marketing, and he is a, also a specialty coffee enthusiast at the University of Massachusetts Lowell's Manning School of Business. His dual research interests focus on in the intersection of marketing and public policy. He is primarily focused on sustainable consumption behaviors. He has published work in the European Journal of Marketing and the Journal of Business Ethics on Consumer Dispositions towards sustainable consumption. He has also published on consumer sustainability issues in the Journal of Business Research, Journal of Public Policy and Marketing, and the Journal of Consumer Affairs. Spencer earned his PhD from the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass Amherst, uh, his MBA from St. John's University, and his BA from McGill University, and also has presented on consumer sustainability at the 2019 SCA Coffee Expo. And also in addition to that, he has presented on marketing and communication for uh, the SCA's webinar series focused on the COVID-19 crisis. We'll link to those in the show notes here as well. But needless to say, Spencer has a very deep understanding of what works in marketing and communication, and especially what resonates with consumers. And that's key to what we're talking about here, because in this conversation, it kind of all boils down to that relationship between your brand and the customer. So I hope you're ready to take a deep dive into marketing and communication. There's a lot of great thoughts in this, and I know it's going to do a lot to help equip you for the road ahead in your business. So without further ado, here now is my interview with Spencer M. Ross, PhD. Well, Spencer, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Chris. Yeah, you've been uh, you've been making the rounds in the specialty coffee world. Uh, you've had a couple of webinars now with the SCA on communication and marketing. Uh, I wonder um, how you have got into this space because you're a, you're a coffee enthusiast, but your your trade and what you do is is academia right now. Tell, tell us yeah. a little bit about how you got to this point of focusing so heavily on communications and and marketing. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting um, for me. Uh, I always uh, found kind of coffee shop, coffee culture type, you know, stuff interesting. Um, as an undergrad, uh, I was in Montreal, and if you're if you're at all aware, the drinking age there is 18. So uh, we were able to go to bars early on. And what was interesting was by the time I was finishing my college uh, my college tour. Um, I was actually spending more time at the coffee shop than I was at bars. Um, and I just kind of backdoored into, in, into the uh, uh, kind of the culture through, through that perspective. And I was a political science major, so I was not really actually into business or anything of that nature. I was more interested in uh, government and, and kind of international politics uh, at that point. And when I came home, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And that kind of got me into understanding uh, what businesses were doing. At that point, I was not, like I said, very interested in business. And um, uh, I kind of went in, uh, as I started doing, re you know, doing some reading kind of on my own, uh, on my own accord, I started learning about corporate social responsibility. I started reading Howard Schultz's book, um, which kind of gave how Starbucks came to be. And I started kind of getting into understanding what companies were doing uh, to do, you know, to do good things. And so my kind of career path led me to an MBA in international marketing. And that kind of started off, you know, with, with a heavily focus on understanding where that was going with coffee and, co you know, larger coffee companies. When I went to do my doctoral work, uh, I, I was kind of a, I was a recession casualty back in 2008. Mm. And, um, as I got into my, my doctoral work, uh, I kind of went from the strategic side, the business side of it to understanding consumers. And as I got into understanding consumers, uh, I started to understand, I was, I was particularly interested in what consumers were doing with response, with sustainability and, and, and so forth. And around that time, I got into drinking. Uh, there was a local shop as I was working on my dissertation, 
um, again, about uh, consumer sustainability. Um, and they served counterculture coffee. And it was my first entry into the specialty industry and what specialty coffee was about. And kind of from there, I started to understand where coffee kind of had this, you know, larger, you know, element in, in terms of people's lives, in terms of consumers' lives, and how specialty coffee as an industry actually was very different from what I had been drinking all these years at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or any of the larger, uh, more, you know, mass market co coffee companies. So it really kind of, it, it kind of my history with coffee, um, kind of my, my career history almost kind of dovetailed with uh, uh, how I saw myself uh, uh, following with coffee as well. So it's just kind of interesting in that regard. Well, that's nice. You, you sort of became more specialized in both as you continued. It, 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 it oddly, that is kind of the direction I, I did go in. And, and so <laughs> the more that I've gotten, you know, and, and when I came out, um, you know, in my first academic, you know, position out in, you know, in, in Boston, um, where, where I currently am, um, uh, I started going to George Howell's shop and even from there that kind of got me in a next level of understanding kind of the behind the scenes and what specialty coffee was about and even more so than just going to a shop that was serving it I you know was getting more into these kind of engaged conversations so again kind of and I started at that time also teaching more you know marketing to my my students so I started thinking about all the things that I would relate to students about coffee vis-a-vis -vis the coffee industry and what I knew about specialty coffee, particular to my, you know, and, and relating that to my students. As sort of a place to start in our conversation, um, I think it'd be good to sort of determine the subject matter in, because when we say communication and marketing, uh, they seem like they could be either, when you're saying it, could be two words that mean the same thing, or two words that are slightly different in their meaning is like when you're teaching your right. students about those things and using coffee as an example, um, where are you starting from when it comes to defining these terms? So generally speaking, um, when we're talking about marketing as a whole, we're, you know, and I, I, I taught uh, mar like a fundamentals course Um or principles of marketing course, both at the MBA level and at the undergraduate level. And uh, when we talk about kind of marketing as a, 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 a total kind of package and a total type of strategy, we're kind of looking very large kind of macro level type of strategy. We're looking at things like understanding the marketplace, understanding what the objectives of a business are, understanding uh, the customer markets, understanding target markets, understanding where your company is relative to competitors and how you are portraying or, or positioning your company to consumers and, and making those distinctions. Part of that then includes the tactics kind of, 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 of marketing, which, which are generally thought, you know, we, we teach the framework of the four Ps, um, price, uh, product, price, place, and promotion. And within those four Ps, that framework, we, we, we've we kind of made, you know, over time, some of the lingo and the jargon has kind of uh, uh, changed and evolved. And so when we talk about promotion, oftentimes what was, has been historically included in that mix has been communications. And so the integral, we call the integrated marketing communications mix that integrated marketing communications mix includes advertising, it includes public relations, it includes uh, personal selling or, or you know, having a sales force or, or people on the front lines who are working you know, as sales associates. Um, in this case, maybe it's even including baristas. Um, it also includes uh, direct and interactive marketing, such as any flyers or, or catalogs. Well, obviously that's not something that, you know, is, is, is current, we currently see many paper catalogs, although there is kind of a, a resurgence in some, in some areas. Um, uh, but also digital marketing and, and digital marketing communications as well. All those kind of areas that we traditionally think of like advertising and communications kind of fall under this broad 
this broader, like I said, broader strategy of marketing. So for instance, when we talk about integrated communications and, and, and advertising and social media, et cetera, et cetera, what we're really kind of talking is about not just doing those things, but how they integrate with what your business is offering, what the, you know, your, how to inform consumers about price, how to inform consumers about practices or strategies or promotions or uh, 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 places that they can go find your product, how to create awareness. All of those things are kind of, big, are, are, are kind of part of the bigger picture of, of what marketing strategy should be. Okay. So those are things like social media, for example, might be, these are like planets that orbit the sun of this core identity that you've got. Exactly. Certainly that's, that's, that's the way that we have traditionally taught marketing. Like I said, as, as kind of at a, at a fundamental level, it's kind of, yeah, I think the planets analogy is kind of an interesting one. (laughs) I never heard it that way, but yeah, that, that probably would be an appropriate way of talking about it. And it's not to say that one planet is less important. You know, we're not talking about dropping Pluto off of the solar system here or anything like that or saying that it's, you know, something else. <laughs> but but, but we're, we're, we're basically saying that it is a significant, you know, contribution and is a significant portion of strategy that falls within an even larger strategy that is used kind of to, to run and manage the, you know, the business as a whole. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in making that distinction, I think maybe people might consider this to be sort of an esoteric conversation. <laughs> um, what do you think is the practical application of those distinctions in terms of like, why is it important to know that the core of what you do isn't necessarily your Instagram page? Right. Right. Um, What is the importance of making these distinctions? So um, if we look at it, you know, if if we take what is the point of communications, for instance, and and I think that this is one of the reasons why I think it is important to make this distinction. Part of the reason that you're 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 communicating is to provide information to and in, in this context, it would be providing information to your customers. So part of that information that you're providing is about to customers is about who you are as a company and what you're doing as a company. And so who you are as a company is part of, you know, is part of the brand. And obviously we see a lot of kind of, and you mentioned Instagram, you know, a lot of, and, and, I, and I say that it is, inter- it is interesting because a lot of specialty coffee particularly has a, a great kind of tendency to go towards that aesthetic. And it makes, there's a logical sense to that. And Instagram is a great platform to doing that. But if, but for most businesses and for most shops, for most roasters and so on, aesthetic is not the only thing that they're going to want nor need to be communicating to customers. So in that regard, knowing what you need and what you should be and what customers are looking for to be communicated to them is important. Building a brand is going to be important and certainly strong brand building, particularly when, if we're talking about COVID-19 and you know, where, where consumers loyalties are gonna lie around certain brands, certainly that is important to communicate, but it is also you know, necessary to communicate some of those utilitarian sort of, of, of information pieces to the consumer as well. You know, having a, 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 an Instagram where you are telling consumers what your changed hours are is going to be important. But Instagram is also not going to be the only platform where your consumers are going to be checking. And in fact, because of the way that the algorithms work, consumers may not see that you've you've posted on Instagram and that you've changed your hours. So when we're talking about hours here, you know, what your hours are and that you're offering curbside, you know, pickup or, or so forth, those are all things that in the larger scheme of marketing would fall under kind of the, the distribution area of, of marketing study um, or the place, or that, that would be one of the four Ps is place area of marketing study. And so if you're saying, oh, we're just going to communicate, uh, 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 you know, pictures of, of, of people, you know, doing Chemexes at home, and that's nice and, and, and it's great, and we're going to put that on Instagram, that's nice and great as well. But there's other in areas of marketing strategies that also need to be communicated 
to consumers. And so it's important to look at communications as part of that larger strategy because it, understanding where it fits in your larger strategy will help you understand what you need to be communicating and informing consumers of. Well, this is really difficult for people to do, it seems, because there are a lot of different uh, pieces that go into a business that call right. for our attention. And um, even people, I think, who are very, would consider themselves very good at um, social media or marketing have sort of a a real favorite channel that they they focus on and thereby, because it's flourishing, would consider themselves to be very good. Others mm-hmm. would just shun it and say, well, I'm, I'm running a business. I don't have time to you know monkey around with um, social media or all this other stuff. I just like update our Facebook page sometimes with mass posts of right. like tons of information and hope it sticks. So the idea of using our time wisely and investing in something that's going to um, you know, grow our communication and marketing um, chops really uh, sustainably. Um, I think that's a major thing for for people. So, what what kind of strategy should we use in focusing? Like, what what are the channels we should be focused on? Because we have all these different options to choose from. And I feel like it just is paralyzing sometimes to know where to start, and that that place will you know, if tended to bring something to fruition for our business. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the concept that, and, and even as somebody who's been around and who's kind of, you know, age wise, I kind of straddle the, I guess they're calling the micro generation Xennials, right. I kind of straddle the X gen X <laughs> and, 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 and millennial in terms of, you know, where I, my, my understanding of technology is, and I've personally kind of always been on the lookout, you know, for what's, you know, coming up and, and so forth. And and it is very interesting now to see like kind of the myriad of communication channels and, and platforms and so forth that are out there. And, 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 you know, there are platforms that are certainly more niche. Um, and obviously it's not going to be an effective use of time uh, to be worrying about those particular platforms, I think part of it is def. It, 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 there's a there's a substantive uh, argument for looking at where all of your consumers are, and so part of I think understanding uh, how to, to to deal with this kind of you know how to take this from a strategic perspective is really kind of listening to your customers. And in the middle of this, I know that that can be very difficult because you're sort of saying, okay, well this is, is, is a strategy you would take in a normal time. And, and clearly these are not normal times, you know, we're, we're not doing new, new, re- we're trying to basically kind of, you know, uh, uh, if I may use that meme, you know, put the tape over the, the flooding barrel of water there. Um, uh, it, 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 it does require that kind of consumer centric approach to doing communication strategy. So yes, I think you're right. You know, having a, a particular channel, uh, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit, you know, some days I'll go a little bit more towards Twitter and some days I'll go a little more towards Instagram and, you know, I, I've less so gone on TikTok. Um, and I don't know that that's where most of the customers are going to be. Um, but I do think kind of having a multi-approach consumer centric strategy is, is beneficial in any normal time. My recommendation would be not just to focus on, uh, yourself and what your preferences are for communications, but to focus on what consumers' preferences for communications are, because, and and that's kind of the core of a consumer-centric communication strategy is finding out what channels your consumers are on. Now, if your target market, if you are approaching your consumers is kind of, you know, uh, uh, a particular age group, and you know that they're not necessarily going to be using Facebook or using Twitter, that, that, that makes sense. Usually we use a strategy that fits who our market is generally and where our market is generally communicating on. If, for instance, you're in a city and you get a lot of tourists and they're on a variety of different channels and you don't know necessarily which platform they're using or their personal preference is coming in from, you know, a, a, another city or, or even an internet, you know, international, 
then it kind of requires you to have that sort of mass market, do a little bit on everything, but do it well, then do it really well on one. And then this kind of sounds counterintuitive, but if you're going to do something really well on one platform and not all your customers or not most of your customers are going to see it, then it's not going to be beneficial to you. So like I say, I think that the, the, the core kind of takeaway is that you're looking at this from a very consumer centric uh, 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 response and not only communicating what consumers need to hear, but communicating where they need to hear it as well. Mm, I, I like that it is um, consumer centric, which you're recommending. And I think when we look at our specialty coffee landscape, a lot of times um, the research that we conduct has more to do with what other people are doing. Um, right. who are similar to us or who are, we view as being, um, same size business, um, same aesthetic, same values. And so, uh, they say, well, if it's good for them, it's good for us and we'll do similar things. Um, however, your locality might be slightly different. And so I wonder, you know, what's the balance between saying, okay, well, here's this giant assumption I'm making about a generation, which you can make, there's, there's research to back that up. Right, um, right, but right. also no generation, no generation is a monolith. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you said yourself, we're just coming up with all sorts of hyphenated ways of you mm-hmm. know, describing whatever, who we are, but you know, your local scene might be, you know, slightly different. And so it seems right. like people are a little bit more focused on the local at this time than impressing their, their friends across the, uh, across the country by having these really nice photos or, or posting, you know, whatever it is they, think is in right now to post, but might not be effective. Right. I, 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 and I, and I see that. And so we talked about Instagram and you're right. It, it is kind of one of those things because I, you know, and, and kind of, you know, my, my, me as an enthusiast, you know, follows a lot of, a, a lot of shops in on Instagram and as an academic, when I get to go to conferences, you know, some people do pub crawls and I'll usually do cafe crawls and I'll go to like, you know, three, four shops in the morning, uh, you know, before, you know, the sessions start. And so it kind of gives me an opportunity to, like you, you said, talking about localities, it gives me an opportunity to see kind of what scenes are like in different areas. And um, one of the things I, I, I think, you know, we see is a lot of the, you know, this stuff is very national oriented on Instagram and so forth. And, you know, I was looking for a couple of examples for things of, you know, people of, of shops that I had been to where, you know, had they done what they had posted on Instagram, had they posted it on Facebook, and then I'll go to the Facebook page, and the Facebook page hasn't, op- you know, opened, you know, uh, it hasn't had any posts in three years. Um, and that's not to say that in a normal time that, that that's problematic, but in a time like this where people are not necessarily behooved to, you know, look at your, your, your specific Instagram, you know, account or see it in, 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 in their feed, then you need to have that information elsewhere as well. What it also means is that you're right. It, it's not just about, you know, showing up, you know, where you are kind of in, as, as a cultural phenomenon. It is about that triage. So I know, for instance, um, I've seen a couple of, of, of shops that have posted on, on Instagram, but I've seen them also post on Facebook that they pivoted some operations towards offering pantry like uh, items. Um, whether it's flour or eggs or, or lo, you know, from local farmers that, you know, are not accessing the grocery stores immediately or so forth. And so you're right in those, in those aspects and in those types of shops, the focus is now around the operations and it is around what is local, not what is around what is uh, a, a brand aesthetic, you know, that, that, that is kind of keeping up with the Joneses on a national level. And it is kind of a very interesting thing that you're, you're mentioning because, um, uh, you know, there is some competition, I think, within some of the cities, you know, obviously, there's a, a piece of the specialty coffee pie, and everybody in a particular city wants a piece of that pie. Um, but when we look at the industry, it is very kind of, uh, the, the, as I see it, there's kind of a lot of co uh, competition um, in terms of people wanting to help each other out, particularly because they're small businesses, and recognizing that 
um, within a particular locale uh, that there's still kind of, you know, uh, maybe, you know, a little bit of, of, of competition. And you see, you know, barista throwdowns and, and, and Thursday night, th you know, throwdowns, latte th art throwdowns um, that kind of bring baristas in a particular city together. Um, and obviously that's not necessarily going on as much because obviously the pivot now is towards kind of what can we inform the consumers about what they should know that our operations have changed and here's how they've changed. And that does require more of a localized content than it does more of a, here's what we're doing in this city versus here's what we're doing in this city. Because every city even right now is under different constraints, right? And that, that that's one of the things about having governors making, you know, different, uh, uh, decisions about what should be open, what should not, when it should be open, when it shouldn't, and all of that, which means that that information has to be tailored, not towards necessarily tourists or people coming from elsewhere, but for people who are going to be basically local and who are going to be looking for that very localized information. So I, I think you're right. I think that this does kind of change the way and the mode of, of, of communications in, in, in but it, need, it, it needs to because the circumstances are requiring it. So when we're talking about, you know, just leaning into our locality a little bit more and amping up, I think a lot of people are amping up their communication, right? Like, especially right. now, and historically, maybe, I don't know, you know, in, in small, scrappy, independent stores have uh, let themselves off the hook for not having the best communication. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's endearing until it's not, until it's right. not, you know, um, it's a process. You've said that yeah. it's a process to build relationships through communication because that's what you're doing. And, and, uh, right. and we were talking about this before we started recording here. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about the importance of, of really embracing that this is a process, uh, not necessarily a formula and that, um, what we're really doing is building relationships through communication. Right. So, if we look at kind of the fun, you know, there, there, there's, there are multiple functions for why we communicate um, in marketing, you know, and, and, and one reason is to create, generally speaking, awareness. Um, we typically talk of, of, of what we call hierarchy of effects model, where we get people, you know, make people aware. Um, we're trying to, you know, uh, uh, get them kind of interested in what we're doing and, and kind of feel a little bit of motion. So that way it kind of drives them towards a particular behavior, such as visiting our shop or buying a bag of a whole bean or coming in and getting an espresso or so on and so on. And a lot of that starts that that communications kind of funnel starts with the idea that we're trying to just raise consumer awareness and, 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 and that triggers kind of onto, you know, into the, you know, into this, uh, this sequence of events. Um, the other function of, of communications, though, is not just creating a, a awareness of a particular product or service or whatever it is that you're doing, but it is about building that relationship. And, you know, I, I look at this in terms of what the value of communications and interpersonal communications is in any normal interpersonal scenario, right? We are trying to communicate with friends. We are trying to communicate with family. We try to communicate with spouses or partners or anybody else in our life. And we know that the more we're able to, to make those communications, the more we're able to quote unquote invest in those communications, the more A, fulfilling those, those those relationships are and b the more sustainable those relationships are so if we are putting the effort into those communications in our interpersonal lives with the people around us in those circles we shouldn't i you know take that analogy any differently for communicating as businesses with our customers, mm -hmm. right? You want to quote unquote, invest in those relationships and you want to invest in those relationships just like you would in, 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 in your interpersonal relationships. A, because you want to make those relationships more meaningful because you want to have customers who, you know, know what you're doing and who you know about them and so forth. And that way when uh, something like this crisis uh, occurs, you are now able to tap into those relationships and lean on your customers just as they lean on you. And also be because they're, they're sustainable. We know from the research, for example, that, that, um, 
investments, m both monetary time and, and so forth, those investments that are made in marketing, um, whether it's advertising, whether it's in product innovation, whether it is in what, whatever, marketing investments in an economic downturn actually pay off in the long term. And it can be, you know, challenging, for instance, and, 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 and certainly, you know, for a lot of small businesses to take mo to make monetary investments in a financial downturn, but relationship investments are, you know, can 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 be done, you know, fairly uh, readily with some of these communications tools that we have, you know, like like Instagram, like Facebook, you know, using maybe even a platform, you know, a very small platform for social media management like Hootsuite um, mm -hmm. that would allow you to operate on multiple channels, you know, at at you know, an, in a single uh, in a single website or a single app. Um, you know, making those kind of in investments will pay off in the long term because when you invest in those relationships and you make them sustainable, they actually pull you through on the other side when you're working on recovery. And in fact, part of the, the, the point of, of making those counter cyclical investments in marketing in an economic downturn is because it actually means you have to spend less acquiring, retaining, attracting new customers later on. Those customers are going to be consistently sticking with you because of the investments that you're doing and that you're making at the present moment. You know, part of, you know, what we do, you know, it's a very relational business, being small or even medium-sized um, uh, coffee businesses, independent coffee businesses especially, have a, a real emphasis on these relationships. Um, and at the same time, I, I think we want to be very professional about how we right. go about it. And so we've got a couple of different voices coming at us. There's the the one that's formula driven that wants to, you know, hustle and and see the the growth and and be focused on the numbers. And then there's the gut level um, intuition that we develop through service and through just right. doing what we do every day that we also seem to uh, have to listen to and, and maybe sometimes have a hard time listening to because it doesn't always show in the numbers right away. Right. I would concur with that statement, and and certainly per personally, the way I you know look at it, and and the way I approach you know teaching my students or you know doing my research, and you know kind of the methods that I would use to do research is that there's no one silver bullet for any particular strategy. There's no one silver bullet you know to say let's just look at the data and ignore our gut. You know we use data to inform our decision making, and part of that it relies on what we know from the past. So we, you know, are, are, are looking at things that we've done, they've worked, they didn't work, this is how the numbers came out, this is how the numbers didn't come out. And in a time of uncertainty, you know, looking at the numbers, certainly, obviously, for for, mo for many roasters, you know, and in, in, in cafes that are that are small is going to be daunting. Um, and, you know, I know that the SDA had done a report that was talking about feelings in, uh, in the, within the industry of how you know many people you know foresaw that you know or, or, or thought that they would, were going to be able to make it through this um, you know and 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 there there are certainly going to be people that are going to realize that it is not something that they are sadly going to be able to sustain. Um, but you're right; it, it is partially the reality of those numbers, and part of it is well, um, the numbers you know, in the, in the now is going to, are going to be painful in the long term. If we're looking to stay in this industry and we're looking to have, you know, thrive afterwards, um, uh, that we're going to tr have to trust some of our gut and say that some of these decisions are going to be, I wouldn't say impulsive, but, but gut oriented, um, and say, we're going to have to make these types of pivots and, and adjustments to survive. And in some respects, that kind of, it, 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 there are many areas where specialty coffee industry, particularly because it is not necessarily on the same scale as other industries, is going to have those advantages because it can be, and, and, and individuals and entrepreneurs in the industry can be more agile in their approaches to doing business that, it is much more difficult for some larger companies to to 
have that agility, to communicate that agility, to maintain the, that agility. They're, they're banking more on brands and brand loyalty and so forth than they can on the individual relationships that the industry is based on. And so for me, you know, we, we kind of going back to the beginning, you know, and, and kind of how my, my career kind of tracked with my progression and interest in the industry, you know, it, it, it as I've seen that, it has been one of, I think, the positive things of, of the specialty coffee industry is its relationship basis um, with those consu- you know, with consumers and, and those who are willing to make those investments, like I said, not just financial, but time and all, and, and all of that. Those are the ones that, you know, investing in those relationships are going to find the, their businesses will have a likely higher, you know, si- potential for success than those who are otherwise saying, you know, well, well, I don't know, don't know what to do, or I'm not going to take the time to do it, or it's all kind of confusing. And so therefore I quit, um, you know, it, 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 and that's the thing is, is you mentioned kind of the, 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 the paralysis of the moment. And sometimes that paralysis just, it definitely requires taking a step back taking a deep breath, taking a second deep breath even, and looking at it from the bigger picture and saying, okay, now that we've taken those deep breaths, what are we going to do? And let's make an actual plan rather than just kind of, you know, figure it out off the cuff. And yeah, there is some of that agility, but putting together something where you can, you know, a framework of, of a strategy to start with, is kind of, I think that is, is important because that's kind of what will get you through this. And that will push you towards those, you know, back to those relationships that you were talking, you know, as you were talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, this really makes me want to explore the idea of what we're doing now. It, it, I don't want to say that we have more time on our hands because the, the, I think most people are busy. It's just a different yeah. type of busy. Yes. Um, owners are sometimes more busier than they ever have been, but, um, where that time and energy is going is, is different and it can be invested more into these types of communications. I mean, you're, you're, at, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we are spending, you know, I, I, I'm home, you know, I'm, I, you know, as I, I've said, you know, teach at UMass Lowell and our campus has gone virtual for the rest of the semester. And so I've been home doing lectures. My wife been working from home and, you know, we've got two kids and you're right. You know, it seems like I've got all the time to do all the research projects that I wanted to do and I'm not getting any, you know, anything done that I, you know, otherwise have set out to do, but it is an opportunity cost. And, you know, taking stock of what those opportunity costs are, are going to be important to, to having that long-term success. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're taking advantage of these opportunities. I see a lot of people doing that and we advocate that on this show too. However, I'm also concerned and would be interested in your thoughts on the idea of how to embrace these things, how to, you know, show that agility and, and resiliency in this moment, taking on communications and strategies for doing that, that can be sustainable post-COVID and won't simply be like all, you know, hot fire right now and then just cool off real big time once things get back to what we would say is the, a new normal Um because then it seems like customers might feel jerked around a little bit by that. Right. Um, so how does a business go about creating a system of communication that's, that's organic, that's doable, that's doable long-term, that's mm-hmm. also something that's beneficial right now? Um, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned before looking at, you know, this from a kind of a, a from a consumer centric, you know, uh, approach to communications. And I think that's the most important is not thinking about, you know, and this and, and, and so what's interesting about, you know, COVID now is in having these types of discussions is some of this is kind of best practices that we, sh- you know, we should be doing and businesses should be doing in normal times. And it's easy to kind of fall off the wagon and, and, and forget about it and, and change your strategy. And obviously, as, as things, you know, maybe are, are, you know, you can make more investments or make more financial investments, you, you know, it's easy to do in, you know, in, in 
in good times and now things are going leaner and it's a little bit more what are the opportunity costs of me being on this platform versus this and time wise and blah 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 but again i think that the the, the key the key thing into any of these you know any businesses in the coffee industry and in the specialty coffee industry in particular is recognizing the consumer centricity around what you're doing because unlike a company like Starbucks, for instance, who, as I've said, you know, I, I kind of got into, you know, was one of the big coffee, you know, companies that, that I got into in, a, in, in, in during my master's, um, you know, a lot of their investments are also going to be financial and there'll be things like full page ad in the New York Times that our shops, you know, are going to be opening, you know, and we're welcome to, you know, you're welcome to come back. They're going to have, you know, maybe commercials on T, you know, on TV or so forth saying that. So there's going to be actual, you know, dollars to be spent there. It's going to be much more difficult for, uh, 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 some of the smaller shops in the specialty coffee industry to have that kind of budget and put that in, in, in you know, and, and make those financial investments, which means that it does require, particularly from the communications angle, getting a little bit scrappier, recognizing that you can kind of do some of what you had been doing, but make it a little bit more polished or you're right. There is kind of the agility um, in, in the industry in terms of what is being communicated I, I, you know, and, and, and I look at, because I, like I said, I, knowing the industry, I look to Instagram to see what's going on. I don't know that everybody else does, especially if they're not an enthusiast of specialty coffee, particularly, maybe that's just their, you know, their favorite shop and maybe they know it's specialty coffee. Maybe they don't know it's specialty coffee. It's just their favorite shop. Um, for me, I, I've looked at, you know, kind of Instagram and I say, okay, well, when all this started, you know, businesses were being closed and shops were being closed and roasteries were closing up. And then it was realizing, okay, well, we can do things a little bit differently. And so the, the communication was to consumers on Instagram was, okay, we're done. Unfortunately, we've had to let, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're sad that we have to close up. Um, you know, we hope we can see you on the other side of this whole thing. Then as kind of it was okay well we can implement you know appropriate distancing procedures that are consistent with cdc guidelines and so we're going to open up and we're going to do curbside and now here's this okay and then it became okay well we're going to use the inclusive app so now you can order online and we're not going to take you know cash payments if, if possible so uh here's where the, the the app is and you can pay through the app etc cetera, etc cetera. and so you started to see this kind of volume of yeah okay we are being agile, we are changing things and we are putting this information outward. And it is a very fluid situation and it's fluid both in the social societal scale, but also for our business. And so there's no reason that I would expect consumers to say, oh, well, you know, this is you know, not normal time. So they're not, you know, very polished. No, consumers are looking for, especially because this is an acute, you know, uh, uh, crisis, they're, they're looking for this as, okay, well, we understand. And, and because specialty coffee shops and roasters tend to have those relation, tend to have those relationships with consumers, it allows consumers and it helps those, those, those consumers be more flexible in their understanding of both what the strategies are that are being changed and how they're being communicated. Again, going back to that kind of relationship analogy of, of, of how we deal with friends and spouses and partners and, and so forth, right? If there is an issue or if there is a problem and we're able to communicate it, if we are, you know, having a stressful time at work and we're, you know, blowing off steam or whatever, our, when we have those relationships invested in, it is easier for our, you know, our, our friends and our family and so forth to be able to accommodate us when we are having those problems. They are able to help us through those problems. They are able to give us feedback in return for those problems. And so, and yeah, it is a little bit scrappy and we may have things a little bit more chaotic, but there is a forgiveness that comes because of those relationships. And in fact, the research on consumer brand relationships does show that having those relationships builds trust with consumers. And by having that trust with consumers, the, the, the research also shows that the trust allows consumers to be more forgiving.
And so there absolutely is that element in, yes, it may seem a little bit scrappy. It may seem a little bit hectic. It may seem a little bit chaotic. It may not be the game that you would play in a quote unquote normal circumstance, but by understanding those, you know, kind of acute situations, you're able to give that information to an understanding consumer. Mm, I love it. So when now we're talking about the company itself and for, what we're talking about, it's usually upper management, um, social media managers that get, mm -hmm. you know, sort of briefings and from uh, other meetings and then pass that information along or just the owner on, you know, Twitter, whatever. But when we're talking about internal communications, uh, we have to be concerned with how our staff are communicating what we want people to know and understand and how we want people to see our brand and our our company. Um, and to kind of wrap up here, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, proper ways of going about um, communicating the messaging to staff so that they can communicate the message to uh, consumers as they interact with us. So I think the answer to that question, and again, this is, this is one of those, it's, you, you, you kind of have to take a step back and take those couple of deep breaths and just kind of start and maybe, you know, starting with a blank piece of paper. Um, and part of it is going back to the drawing board and kind of defining who you are as a company, defining what your kind of your, your purpose is for being there and recognizing, you know, where the customer's role is in that. And then, the middle of that between your business and your, your, your customer is kind of, is, is those frontline employees is you, is your employees, is the people doing QC at the roastery is the people doing that, you know, is your roasters is your baristas is your back of house and any of those types of people. And that means that you're having to kind of go back and, and kind of fill in. Okay. If this is our mission and this is our customer and these are our employees, what is the culture that we are creating around this mission that is something we can communicate and foster to a, and with not not to our employees but with our employees right we ha internal marketing becomes an important part of the that conversation and internal marketing essentially is when we're talking about onboarding employees and the kind of the messaging and the communication and all those areas and elements of uh, of marketing where we're looking at that for our you know for the companies for the businesses employees the same is when you're looking at kind of who your target market is as a consumer you know your hiring practices you know in it ordinarily would would um, uh, in, in, in an ideal world reflect the type of employees that reflect your company's culture. And if you are having that type of, of you know, uh, employee, then the same kind of approach to communication should occur with them because these are, are, are your resources. These are people who are going to be serving coffee curbside from seven to two and having their masks fogged up and their glasses fogged up and all those kinds of things. And, 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 and you know, and putting themselves a little bit, you know, and certainly at risk of being there on, on the front line. The same thing is going to, you know, be with your roasters who are putting, you know, they're going into the roastery and, you know, your QC, you know, your QC people are going to be in the roastery. And those are people who are going to be, you know, putting themselves out and working long days because, you know, there are more people who are brewing at home. And so you've got to get bags of coffee out to put shipments out. So that way people can get their coffee at home, if not at curbside. And again, it is partially fostering that culture that is both communicative. And I think part of it is appreciative, right? That you're appreciating the type of work that your frontline and your service employees are otherwise doing that is going to continue and perpetuate that culture beyond just what's going on now. I think that, you know, one thing that's a little bit different with this type of scenario as opposed to the recession of, of 10 years ago of 2008, 2009, is that this pandemic is more of an acute crisis. It happened sort of suddenly in February and now we're, you know, almost two months later and, you know, we're, 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 things have shifted really quickly, really fast in a way that we have not otherwise, you know, as a society 
recognize, right? This is not a slow roll towards what's going on here. And so as a result, it means that both communicating with their customers, but also your employees is paramount because your employees are going to be worried on a day-to-day -day basis what's going on. And that's that that's understandable. There is a, 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 a certainly empathy it becomes a part of that. One of the other things, and this also I think we find it both with the customers and with the employees, and perhaps even more so with the employees, um, because the, they are your resources, is the concept of transparency in your uh, uh, communications. And it is, it is, you know, certainly from a business perspective, from an owner's perspective, there are numbers that, you know, are tough to otherwise be talking about with, you know, if you're an owner and you've got multiple parts to your operation discussing the nuts and bolts of the bottom line and where things are is, you know, not something that, you know, necessarily a barista is going to, is going to want to hear. Maybe they are not going to be as appreciative of, of it. And there are fears within the greater macroeconomic context of the job market and the employment market. But by allowing that the, the, the conversation to be not one way, but two ways, by saying we're not just going to dictate from the top down, but we're going to have a conversation two ways, that will help, I think, strengthen your relationships with your employees and, and, and make some of that understandable. You know, I mentioned that I had lost my job in the 2008 recession, and one of the things that was diff it was it was challenging for me was that I knew I lived in New York at that time, and everybody around in New York was was struggling, and uh, it, it was tough because. On the one hand, I knew why I was let go. On the other hand, it didn't make me feel any better. I recognized that, I, you know, and I had struggled with that. And and certainly it was, you know, one, one reason why I was like, do I want to go back into, to, to in, you know, maybe stay in an industry or do I want to, you know, continue along academia for other reasons I can go into why academia was a, was a stronger choice for me. Um, but uh it definitely kind of helped me to reconcile, okay, the company was transparent. I know what's going on. I know the environment and I know why they're doing this. And it's not just me. And it does, does it, does it take the sting away? No. Does it make my feelings any less, any less valid? No. But having that communication and the transparency with my employers was helpful. Like I said, in, in any kind of communication scenario, we've got multifaceted elements of what communications is, why we do that, and how we do it. And the why is the transparency and the auth the authenticity. The the how is empathy. And I think right now is where you know certainly that that like I said, forgiveness and in the agility of what's going on. Um, it, it comes from that ability to be empathetic, both to your employees and with your employees and to your customers and with your customers. Mm, that's a great way to uh, present that as being with and uh, the, the hashtag slash mantra of we are in this together. Yeah, It might be trite after a, a few months to, to say, you know, as a, as a tagline, but is absolutely true. And um, as a cornerstone of what we do in our communications, togetherness is a pretty solid foundation. Um, Spencer, I'm, I'm really happy to have gotten a chance to talk to you and I'm thankful for the work that you've done and what you've presented for Specialty Coffee. It certainly has been uh, helpful to us here today. Um, where can people go to kind of follow you online and you know read some of your, your work and uh, yeah, listen so to some more interviews? <laughs> So um, generally speaking, uh, I'm pretty much on almost all social media communications at at S Ross MKTG, um, like my first initial last name and MKTG for marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, you know, if anybody wants to find me, you know, they can find me on the UMass Lowell, uh, you know, faculty directory. But, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm young enough to, you know, that I'm on all the communications channels. So you're just as well to reach me on social media as well. Excellent. Spencer, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much Absolutely. again. Thank you for having me, Chris. My pleasure.
Well, I hope that that episode was enlightening and was helpful in helping you set the trajectory for where you're going to go with your marketing and communications. And that at the end of this, it brought clarity to you. Ultimately, I find that that is one of the things most lacking in how we approach our marketing and communication is just clarity because there's so much to focus on. So thank you very much to uh, Spencer for joining us on the show. We really appreciate your insights, your expertise in helping equip us for success in our businesses and making sure that we're really building those relationships with our staff and our consumers. And obviously communication is at the heart of all of that. You've done so well uh, explaining that to us here today. Thank you. Now, if you want to contact me directly, just email me, chris at keystotheshop.com, C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. If you have questions or comments about the show, if you want to join the Keys to the Shop Mighty Network, uh, you can do so by emailing that address. And also, if you have any questions about uh, working with Keys to the Shop Consulting, Um, I mentioned this in a few shows, but uh, I have greatly reduced the rate of the -the over-the-phone consultation that I offer, and it's been very beneficial for all of my clients who have had this as a part of their consultation packages. Um, Really, it's amazing the kind of clarity that you can get from a really good structured conversation where we're focused on really uh, producing solutions for the issues that are coming up in your business, producing clarity and bringing your business up to a higher level. So again, I've really reduced that rate so that it can be more accessible to you in this time. So if you're interested in that, just reach out to me, chris at keys to the shop.com. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate you all tuning into these shows. Um, If you can share these shows uh, with friends across the industry, that would be wonderful. I'm just so grateful for you all. Thanks again. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.